for this lecture, um, I'm going to be introducing you to uh, the idea of language modeling, which is one of the most core topics in um, uh, natural language processing and understanding. Um, we're going to start out with a traditional view on language modeling and then uh, gradually progress into uh, the state of the art now, which is neural networks, in, particularly, uh, in particular uh, recurrent networks. So let's get started. So the idea behind language modeling is very simple. We want to build a, a probabilistic model that assigns probabilities to utterances. So an utterance can be a, a sentence, we normally think of it, but it might be an utterance in, in the sense of something someone spoke. So uh, as you see on the slide there, basically we want to be able to assign a probability to any utterance, that is um, any string in, in sigma star. Obviously there's an infinite number of those, but if we're careful about the way we build our language model, we should get a nicely defined probability distribution that sums to one if we sum up the probabilities of all the possible strings we could observe. This seems like relatively simple and um, possibly pointless undertaking to assign probabilities to sentences, uh, but it turns out to be a really fundamental issue which uh, almost everything else we do in this field builds upon. So the, to get some starting intuition for why this is useful, uh, consider these examples. So one's from translation. So if we have the two utterances, he likes apples and apples likes he, if these are possible hypotheses from our translation system, we want to be able to get uh, probabilities for each one and compare them and say, well, I probably think that it was the first one because that seems more likely that that's what was said. And a similar thing uh, happened in speech recognition. So in this case, we might have sort of lexical choice. Both of the utterances are syntactically plausible. The first one, he likes apples, seems uh, more semantically plausible. And if our uh, speech recognizer is giving equal probability to both, our language model can uh, uh, split that probability and, and give us an idea for which one is likely to be preferred. So this is the basic idea that by, by getting these probabilities, we can compare utterances. Um, we can also generate them um, and also ask all sorts of interesting questions about them. Note um, here that this idea of language modeling as a probability distribution on strings conflates lots of different issues that a linguist would look at when they, they talk about the acceptability of uh, an utterance. So we're conflating syntactic acceptability uh, with semantic coherence and all these sorts of things. Um, but that turns out to still be quite a useful thing to do. So, um, as far as I'm aware anyway, the idea of language modeling uh, from a statistical sense really goes back to the war and um, uh, people like these two characters, Turing and um, I.J. Good, who were working on breaking uh, German codes. And they had lots and lots of coded German messages coded through something like the Enigma machine in the middle there. And they wanted to uh, come up with a way of decoding these into um, uh, their, their actual German language equivalent. Now you could imagine uh, uh, trying to find the function that, that decrypts these codes in the space of all possible functions. Um, and obviously that's a pretty big space. But if we restrict ourselves to functions which give us well-formed German utterances, then it gets a lot easier. And so they realized this, that what they were looking for is uh, decryptions of these messages which looked like real German. If they just looked like nonsense German, then that's unlikely to be a good uh, uh, way of decrypting these messages. So they started trying to build statistical models of, of language, of German. They started asking the question for how likely it is that I will see any particular German word. Or how likely is it that I'll see any sequence of words? What's a good sequence? What's an unlikely sequence? And so that was really the, the origin of this area, and they came up with lots of interesting statistical results about how to do this for language. Um, so that was a starting point, and, and up until now I've just talked about the idea of assigning a probability to a string. Uh, but if you, if you stretch this a little bit, you can actually take this idea a lot further um, and see lots of other natural language processing tasks as instances of this modeling problem. So in the first example there, I've got uh, a French sentence and its English translation um, concatenated together into one big string. Now, if we have a really good model of uh, parallel sentences like this that can assign a probability to any pair of strings like this, then we have a translation model. So if we observe lots of French sentences 
um, and their English translations, and then we can build a probabilistic models of those strings and say how likely they are. And given any French prefix, we can look for the most likely English suffix, which is going to be its translation. This is exactly how uh, the, the recently introduced neural machine translation models work. Um, it's how Google Translate works, uh, essentially. We can take that further and say, well, if we throw in a bit of conditioning information, here I represent as beta, um, we can also think of things like question answering along the same line. <coughs> Given that I observe some text, here the text is a single utterance, but imagine it's a whole news article. So we observe a long string of a news article um, and we want to ask a question, then uh, we can see that again as sort of what is the probability of seeing this news article, seeing this question and then seeing this answer. Uh, obviously we wouldn't model them all in, in a big bulk way like that, we'd break it down somehow. But you can see the basic idea is that if we can model joint distributions over strings, then we can do a lot with it. Even dialogue is the last example there. That if, again, we have this, this property that if I give you the prefix, we have good joint distribution, then you can look for, for good suffixes, good answers to someone's question. Okay, so that's diverting a bit. So back to the core idea of just modeling joint distributions over strings. So this is what we want to do from a formal, formal perspective. We have a joint distribution, that's the thing at the top there, P of um, W, our utterance. It's of length N, so we've got capital N different words. Um, and the first thing we're going to do, uh, and we almost always do in language modeling, there's a few uh, cases where people don't do this in language modeling, but um, you'll uh, probably never see them. So the first thing we do is um, we use a chain rule to decompose this. So we decompose this into a series of um, conditional probabilities. Now, the first thing to realize about this is it's, it's not an approximation, this is exact. If we can model those conditional probabilities exact, exactly, then their product will be exactly the joint distribution. Now, we do this because it's easier to think of uh, modeling sequences like sentences as a sequential prediction problem. So these conditionals are basically saying the first thing I do is predict the first word, then I predict the second word given the first word, the third word given the first two words, and so on. And at the end, I want to predict the last word given all of the words I've seen before. So now we've turned the problem from modeling joint distributions to modeling conditional distributions with these histories. So we're going to call uh, the things we're conditioning on the history. That's just all the words we've seen up until that point in the utterance. So the core of language modeling is going to be all about coming up with good conditional distributions uh, that we can, that we can uh, multiply to get the joint distribution. Um, as I keep returning to, this, this simple problem of modeling the joint distribution over sentences hides a lot of the complexity of language within it. So the nice thing about uh, language modeling is all we need to train a language model is lots of monolingual text. And that's very easy to get. We don't need any humans to annotate the text or classify it for us. We can just go to the web and scrape English text or German text or whatever it is we want. And so we can very easily get a large amount of data. Um, uh, if you have access to a web index, you can get trillions of words of um, language. So from a machine learning point of view, this is great because we have an objective function to, to match the probability distribution we see. We have limitless amounts of data. Um, initially, this might not seem that useful as a learning problem, but it turns out the more you look at this language modeling problem, the more you realize that much of language understanding and with language understanding goes AI is hidden in this problem. So here's a very small example. So the first utterance I have is, there she built a, and then we're asking for the probability distribution over what you might see next. Now, if you just see that utterance, your distribution over what, what you would see next is going to be very uh, flat. There's lots of things that could come next. You don't really have much idea. You don't know where there is. You don't know who she is. You don't know what she would want to build. Um, so that's, that's a pretty hard uh, problem to predict the next word. But if I give you more context, so in the second example, if I tell you that Alice went to the beach, there she built a... Hopefully at that point your distribution is starting to get quite peaked around something like a sandcastle. So she was probably building a sandcastle on the beach. Maybe she was building a boat because boats go in the sea or something like that. But at this point your distribution is getting very peaked about what could come next. And the reason it is is because you understand language. You understand that in the second utterance she is Alice 
and there is beach. So you've re resolved those uh, co-references. And you can do that because you understand the syntactic structure of the first utterance. You understand where the subject and object are, where the, uh, the verb phrase is. All of these things you do automatically and you bind the there and the she. And then using the semantics that uh, at a beach, the th sort of things you might build are sandcastles or things that go in the water, you can uh, constrict your distribution. So if we can get a uh, automatically trained machine to do that, then we've come a long way to uh, solving AI. So, so this is a cool problem. We have limitless amounts of data and we have an objective function which hides a lot of um, uh, reasoning and intelligence within it. Whether we can get access to that depends on, on how far we can go with the modeling. So the first thing you should worry about any new task like this one I'm introducing is how do we evaluate it? So uh, the simplest and obvious evaluation is that if we're talking about probabilities, then we're probably training to match the, the probability distribution. So we probably want to hold out some test data and then ask with our, our model, what is the probability of this test data? We, we normally do that in the form of the cross entropy, which is just equivalent to, to asking what probability does this model assign? Uh, the cross entropy has this nice intuition that you can think of it in terms of the bits you would need to represent the distribution. So it gives you this nice intuition. And that also connects it to uh, compression. Now, as an aside, if you've ever studied text compression or something like that, you might realize that the problem of assigning a probability to a string and text compression is exactly the same problem. So if you have a good language model, you also have a good text compression algorithm. And both we can think of in terms of the number of bits we can compress our sequence into. More commonly in language modeling, you'll hear people talk about the perplexity. And that's simply just the, um, the cross entropy raised to the uh, power of two, sorry, two raised to the power of the cross entropy. And you can sort of think of this from the, the name sort of gives you a clue of surprise or, or um, uh, how surprised the, the language model was by what it saw next. Um, if it's not at all surprised, you'll get a perplexity of one. So if it always knows what's coming next. So that's, that's evaluation. So generally you'll see, uh, especially when we're training our language models to predict words, you'll see people report results in terms of perplexity. Uh, when people um, uh, predict at the character level, often you'll see them report results in, in terms of bits per character. Okay, so once we've got an evaluation, we need to worry about data. So in language modeling, uh, we're doing a time series problem. We're predicting the future given the past. And in time series problems, well, stepping back a bit, in machine learning, we know that the first lesson of machine learning is to separate your test data from your training data. If you don't get that right, uh, you'll never be able to work out whether your model's any good. So now when it comes to time series, we have to be extra careful because we always want to predict on the future. Because if we're using any sort of predictive time series model, we observe the past and we predict the future. And in, in your training and test uh, setup, you don't want to mix those up because you might artificially inflate your results. So language modeling is a time series problem. So we want to be careful about uh, collecting text in the past to predict text in the future. Secondly, often our text comes from uh, structured documents, articles, web pages, things like that. So we also want to be careful about not mixing these up between test and training. We don't want to have half a, half a um, novel in training and the other half of the novel in text. Um, because again, we'll artificially inflate our ability to predict the future. So we want to separate things up nicely. We also want big uh, corpora, big um, training and test sets. Uh, if you want to do language modeling um, in the wild, in industry, uh, you need to be training your model on billions of words at least. Um, we do this on a large scale. A lot of um, research papers report results on quite small data sets, but if you want to be confident your model works, uh, in practice, you need to, to get to those large, larger data set sizes and also larger vocabularies. So in the real world of, um, well, I don't know if the web is the real world, but uh, places like predicting text on the web, predicting translations for Google Translate, the actual vocabulary you need is, is big. Um, it's, it's at least in the hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of possible words you could predict. So you want that in your data as well. Um, if you look at various papers, um, possibly ones that I'll point to, um, possibly ones that I've um, uh, co-authored, you'll see people often use the pen tree bank, a particular version of the pen tree bank which has been processed 
in a, um, a not very useful way, or what's called the billion word corpus, um, which is a bigger corpus for uh, evaluating these models. Um, I suggest both of these are flawed and you should probably not use them and we should really stop using them, um, but for some reason we keep, do, keep using them. So the pen tree bank is very small, so that goes against what I said about using big data. It has a, the, the vocabulary has been artificially um, uh, restricted, so that's also not very representative. And also it's been processed, so it's been lowercase, the punctuation's been removed. All of these things take it further away from what we might think of as a real language. Um, in the billion word corpus, there was the unfortunate decision made to uh, randomly sort the sentences in this corpus before splitting off the training and, and test sets. And if you think about that, that breaks both of the, the rules I said about separating out the future from the past and also making sure um, uh, articles in the test don't overlap with articles uh, in the training data set. So um, try to resist the temptation to use these data sets. Um, we're still somewhat lacking in good data sets for some reason, despite how easy it is to produce these things. But uh, things like the Wikitext data sets that I referenced there are, are not a bad place to start. There's a small one and a big one, so you can start small and then get bigger. Or you could create your own and put it up on the web for everyone to use. OK, so that's the intro. So I've done some history and some background and told you a bit about evaluation and data. And so from now on, let's talk about uh, models. <coughs> And um, uh, to give you an idea of where we're going to go, we're going to start out talking about very simple count-based, what we call n-gram models. Um, and these are really the, the bread and butter of um, language modelling. That's the way it's been done up until very recently and still present really the most scalable uh, solution to language modelling. Um, then I'll look at more recent... Um, well, not necessarily so recent uh, innovations. So the idea of uh, neural engram modeling, uh, which just takes the first idea and adds a sort of neural network flavor to it. And then really what um, uh, we're interested in, which is uh, recurrent neural network language modeling, which really um, frees us uh, from some of the, the approximations we make um, about these conditional distributions to uh, capture longer range dependencies. OK, so as I said, starting out with um, count-based n-gram modelling. So this is the sort of thing that um, uh, Alan Turing and I.J. Good were, were looking at. So the, the idea is that we want to, um, we've decided to decompose our joint distribution into a series of conditional distributions. But these conditional distributions are still difficult. If we've got a 20-word sentence, by the time we get to the last word, we're trying to predict one word conditioned on 19 other words we saw before. Now, we could do something um, quite uh, uninformed and simple, and simply, for each possible history, create a, a maximum likelihood multinomial distribution over what could come next. So for those 19 words, we could look at how often we saw that set of words in our training set and have a distribution over what word could come next. The problem is 19 words almost never reoccur in a training set. So you're likely to get um, uh, distributions in which the whole of the vocabulary is zero except for one word, um, and you never, do, you never generalize. So the idea behind n-gram Markov models is just to restrict that history, to say, well, we're just going to look at a finite number of the previous words. The simplest version of this is a bigram model. So a bigram model just looks at the previous word. It says, rather than predicting the 20th word given the previous 19, I'm just going to predict the, the 20th word given the previous word. Um, so in the case of my example of there she built a, we would predict that next word just given the word a. So we would look at which words had a good distribution after a. And you can see the limitations of that. We've thrown away the, the context, but that makes it much easier to estimate the distributions. Now, the parameter we can vary here is n, the n-gram length. So um, you can expand that. You can make it a, a trigram, four-gram, et cetera, and you'll get um, more exact distributions. But at some point, you'll stop seeing those distributions often enough. So in red there, I've highlighted this key idea. We've taken the um, joint distribution, we've decomposed it into a series of conditionals, and then we've approximated these conditionals uh, using a bigram Markov assumption. Um, now, as I, I sort of alluded to there, it's very 
straightforward to estimate multinomial distributions for these models. So if I have a trigram model and I want to know the probability of some word W3 after W1 and W2, all I need to do is look at the number of times I observed those three words in my training corpus, divide by the number of times I saw the, the two words in the history, and that will give me the probability of seeing that third word uh, with a simple maximum likelihood estimate. So that's really simple. That, that's the training of this model. Just collect your counts, divide, um, and you've got a maximum likelihood estimate. And now you can see why this is very scalable. This is very easy to do uh, on vast amounts of data. Um, in fact, trillions of words if you're careful about the, the engineering. Um, this suits architectures like MapReduce. If you've seen uh, MapReduce architectures, Hadoop, these sorts of things before, it's very easy to do uh, in these architectures. So this is exceptionally scalable um, and uh, easy to do. The downside is that um, simply doing what I've described there gives you bad estimates because maximum likelihood is not um, uh, a great estimator for this um, sort of problem. So imagine these two um, examples. So we've seen, so we, we're trying to score the probability of the trigram Oxford Pims eater versus Oxford Pims drinker. And it's quite possible, it's quite likely that we'll never have seen either of these in our training data because they're not the most likely uh, uh, sequences of words. But they're perfectly uh, semantically um, coherent to us, except for maybe the PIMS eater one. Um, so both of those are going to come out with count zero. So we're going to come out with probability zero of seeing either of these after Oxford PIMS. And that's not very useful because we really want to be able to differentiate them. So the obvious solution, and um, the, the way this works in uh, most en well, all n-gram language modeling, is we have some sense of back-off. So we want to take our trigram estimate and we want to smooth it with a bigram estimate. So we want to say, if we're not very confident uh, about the next word given the previous two, let's look at the next word given the previous one. And if we're still not confident of that, let's just look at the probability of the next word. So here this corresponds to dropping the word Oxford from the context and just looking for Pim's Eater versus Pim's Drinker. Now, it's much more likely that we'll have seen Pim's Drinker in our corpus, so hopefully we would assign it a higher probability. So this is the basic idea of um, uh, back-off or hierarchical smoothing of language models. Now, um, there is a huge number of ways to do this, and the sort of traditional art of language modeling is coming up with ways of mixing these different distributions together, conditioning them on the, con the current context and all sorts of things. Uh, the simplest approach uh, is basic linear interpolation. Now, you wouldn't actually do this because it's a bit too simple, but it gives you a flavor of the sorts of things people do. So here we can just say that we've got three estimates, one from the trigram, one from the bigram, and one from the unigram. And we're just going to weight each one by lambda, lambda 3, 2, and 1. We assume that the lambda sum to 1, because if they do sum to 1, then we'll still have a well-defined probability distribution. If they don't sum to 1, then the thing on the left won't be a, a well-defined probability distribution. So that's, that's the simplest approach, just linear interpolation. And that will get you some way to um, a good language model. In fact, um, as I said, there's lots of fancy ways of doing this interpolation, conditioning these lambda weights on exactly what the history is, all sorts of things. There's an idea called discounting, uh, which adds a, an aspect of uh, nonlinearity to this. Um, uh, these are all, all great for language models built on a certain amount of data. Turns out that once you go past sort of a trillion words or thereabouts, simple things like this actually work, um, work very well. Um, often people don't even normalize the, uh, the counts properly. Um, there's something called uh, stupid back-off, which is an approach to, to doing this, which was introduced at Google, um, which dispenses with all the niceties of uh, normalizing distributions, but still works quite well once you have um, a great deal of text. They don't work on small amounts of text. Anyway, the, the most um, popular approach, and if you look at n-gram modeling and the sort of uh, model anyone would put in a paper as a baseline will be something called Kinesini, um, which, if you have the chance, is really worth understanding because um, it's a beautifully engineered algorithm. Uh, so there's a wonderful survey by um, Chen and Goodman that I referenced there that tells you all about the different ways of smoothing language models. Um, the art to smoothing language models is to try and get the, the posterior distribution um, from the language model to match that which we see in real language. And the thing about real language is that um, 
we see power laws in the frequency of um, words, something called Heap's Law. So that is, we see some words that are very frequent, and you can imagine what they are, things like the and a. And then we see a very long tail of words which are very infrequent. And that tail never really goes away. So you're always likely to see more words. Um, and this is why partly that language modeling is hard, because you'll always see new words. Um, and also why uh, uh, classic AI techniques like rule-based AI uh, don't work for language. It's because no matter how many rules you write, there'll always be a long tail of uh, phenomena, words, syntactic structures um, that you haven't seen. Uh, and the payoff from writing uh, more rules diminishes as you go further down the distribution. Anyway, I recommend having a look at that to understand that. Partly because none of our newer models uh, really capture that aspect. So there's a big gap now still that um, uh, is waiting to be uh, filled. Okay, so that was n-gram language modeling very quickly. Um, what I presented was a bit of a caricature of, of n-gram language modeling. If you actually want to do this in practice, you need to read about things like an S and I and, and the more complicated smoothing techniques. But it gives you a flavor that n-gram language modeling is about basically doing lots of counting, um, interpolating together different um, n-gram orders and coming up with a probability distribution. This is good because it's very scalable. Um, it's extremely fast, both to estimate, because there's no training loop as such in, the, in most of the models. Um, it's extremely fast to get a new probability. So if you want to score a, a sentence, um, like in a speech recognizer or a translation system, um, assuming you've indexed them in some way, it's just a single lookup. You just look for the probability of that word, um, uh, possibly over the hierarchy of the n-grams. You might need to look down the n-grams, but it's, it's essentially constant time. So that's, that's fast, much faster than the models we'll talk, on, talk about later on. Um, the, the bad news is that uh, as you increase the n-gram order, you see less and less of those n-grams. And there's a, there's a point where maybe past five grams or thereabouts, where you just don't see these n-grams often enough to get a distribution. So there's diminishing returns. And it means that you can never really capture long-range dependencies. So for instance, the example I gave at the start about um, Alice going to the beach and building a, a sandcastle, an n-gram model is, is exceptionally unlikely to ever capture that, the dependency between Alice and she. Um, it's just too infrequent in the data for to be captured with n-grams. Um, the symbolic nature of these models, that we treat all the words as different symbols, uh, misses a lot of the interesting um, aspects of language. So my example here is we don't capture any relationship between, say, cat and dog. Cat and dog are going to occur in similar context. So if you have a context like, I like to pat something, uh, dogs or cats, um, these words are correlated. These models don't capture that. Um, these correlations are often most apparent in things like morphology. There's not that much morphology in English, but if any of you speak, uh, say, Romance languages, French, Italian, um, or Slavic languages, Russian, or even Turkish, or something like that, you'll know that words can be a lot more interesting than they are in English. So you get a lot more internal structure. Um, and that means there's a lot more correlations between them. So things like gender, agreement, all of these things are not captured well by, by ingram models. So that's, they're the sorts of limitations, and they're the sorts of things that the models I'll talk about next uh, really start to, to improve upon. Okay, how am I doing? Okay, so the next up is we've done ingram count-based models. Now we're going to move on to neural n-gram models. So this is starting to look a bit more like deep learning. Um, but we're going to keep the n-gram restriction. So there's a natural evolution here. So rather than simply counting words, counting n-grams, and normalizing, uh, we're going to use a neural network to predict that distribution for us. And by doing that, we're going to capture a lot of those correlations that I referred to. Um, we're not going to capture the long-range dependencies, but we might be able to capture some of the things like agreement and gender and these sorts of things. So just a very simple refresher. Here's our old friend, the feedforward neural network. Hopefully you're all very comfortable uh, with something like this. We have an input X, we have a hidden layer H, and we have an output uh, Y. So we're going to use um, the simple feedforward neural network to replace the multinomial distributions in our n-gram count-based model. So rather than a multinomial, where we just count and normalize to get our probabilities, now we're going to feed in the history in as X and we're going to read off the probability distribution over the next word as y. So this is what this looks like in a bit more detail. So here, 
uh, I'm being explicit in having a trigram model. So we have two inputs, the previous two words, WN minus two and WN minus one. Um, so in our earlier example, that, that might be built A, and then P is our distribution over what should come next, hopefully with a big peak around Sandcastle. Um, and H, of course, is our hidden layer. Um, I put subscripts N on these to say that now we have N of these in our, in our sequence. So at each, each point, we have a feed forward network at each time step. So we've got our standard um, our hidden layer uh, formulation at the top there. Um, here I'm just concatenating together the inputs to, to make life easier. This is exactly the same as having two linear transformations, V times WN minus one and uh, uh, Z times WN minus two. We just concatenate it together to make it more concise. And also if you implement it that way, it'll be faster. And hopefully you can all remember the softmax um, operation that gives us our distribution P. So the way to think of this is that the, the yellow things at the bottom there are one-hop vectors. That is, they're vectors of the dimension of the vocabulary, but all of their uh, dimensions are zero except for a one, which corresponds to the word at that position. And P will be a dense uh, vector with probabilities uh, at each dimension, which is the probability of seeing that word. Okay, and I'm just using capital V here for our total vocabulary. Uh, and as I said earlier, that should normally be big. Um, so in, in sort of small academic data sets, it might be 10,000, but reality, we really want to be in the hundreds of thousands or millions for our vocabulary. So that's a good thing to keep in your mind here, that P uh, is big. That's a very big vector. If it's a million dimensions, um, uh, that's going to be a concern when you come to implement this. Um, it's less of a concern for the inputs because one hot vectors, of course, you don't have to actually represent the whole vector, you just represent the index, which is one. So that's much more efficient. So there's, there's sort of two ways to think about language modeling that, that help you understand these models. One is that we're given something like a sentence and we want to score the probabilities at each time step, which is the way I've been talking about it up until this point. Uh, and the second way is to think of it in terms of sampling. So if I actually wanted to sample from this model, and we can do this, we can just ask our language model to give us a sentence. And we do that by feeding in uh, the input. So in this case, I put he built a. Uh, we form a bid softmax here, which I've sort of expanded and uh, colored for, for probability there. And the little tilde means sample. So that means um, randomly sample according to that probability. And we might get the word a, which is a good one to see in that context. By doing this, by actually randomly sampling at each time step, feeding that word into the next time step, uh, you can generate sentences. And this is a nice thing to do from a language model because you can get an idea for what sort of uh, sentences it assigns probability to. It's also fun just to see a, a machine generating language. Um, and it's also the basis of how we do what we call decoding in uh, models like speech recognition and machine translation, where we're not given a sentence, but we actually have to generate one. We actually have to find one in the space of, of sentences. And we do that by asking, what's a, what's a good word to come next after the ones I've generated so far? Um, so my animation of what this looks like. So the other thing to, the sort of practical thing to understand about language modeling is we always have some sort of start of sentence symbol. So we always start somewhere. So that's at the bottom left there are the start of sentence symbols. And because it's a trigram, we have two of those because we need two things to condition on. So we start out by feeding our starts of sentences and then we sample a first word and we happen to sample there. And it has a capital letter because words with a capital letter are good words to start a sentence with. Then we feed the one we uh, sampled and the, um, uh, the right hand start symbol into the next step and we sample another word. So now we're sampling given that we've seen a sentence starting with there. And we sample he. And we keep doing this. And this is the way we can sample or generate or decode um, uh, sentences from our language model. We call it sampling when, when the, the operation from the softmax there is a random sample from the tilde. We might call it decoding if we're maximizing, if we're searching for the maximum or the, the k-maximum words coming next. Um, okay, so we're going to model n-grams with feedforward neural networks. Uh, it's going to look something like this. We need an objective function. So we use the classic cross-entropy objective function that we're hopefully all familiar with, with feedforward neural networks. Um, in that, this case, we just, that just looks like some cost layer stuck on top of our probability distribution. 
Um, we need to feed into that the actual observed word. So WN up the top there is the word we actually observed. And so this is a sort of graph, the computation graph we get for one of these, a single time step of a, a feed forward neural network n-gram language model. So what we want to do to train this model is simply uh, exactly what we do for training feed forward neural networks. So we just want to back propagate through this network that cost function. Now, yeah, so um, that's just that explicitly. So uh, hopefully we're all familiar with back propagation and the way we can use the chain rule to get the partial derivatives. And in the case of these language models, it's exactly like any other uh, uh, feed forward neural network you might um, have come across. And my little red arrows there show where the, the gradient's going to go. So, if, so we often like to think of this um, uh, in what we call the unrolled um, network. Uh, this will become more instructive later on when we talk about recurrent networks. But what I've done here is I've just taken that feed forward neural network for one time step and unrolled it for a sequence. So assume we've observed four words. And so we're going to get four instances of this, this neural network. And we connect them all up to our objective function, um, the f up the top there. And if we think about differentiating that f with respect to any of our parameter matrices now, these are four networks, but their parameters are tied. So they're all using the same w and the same v matrices. So what we're going to do is back propagate thr th from f through all those networks. Um, that's a well-defined computation graph. And that's going to give us um, gradient updates for all of those uh, matrices. And then we can just sort of accumulate those and we'll get a total update for the whole sequence. Now, this is not much different to the previous view. As I said, this will become more instructive for recurrent networks. And the key thing to note here is that the path the gradients take forms a tree. So the gradient going down through, say, cost two there, the second time step, has no impact on, on cost one or cost three. So each one of those columns is independent. And that's really handy because it means you can do each one of them independently. You can put each one on a different um, CPU, a different GPU, a different computer. Um, and if you have uh, billions of these sequences that you're training on, you can distribute them across your cluster, uh, back propagate through each um, time step, accumulate the updates in one, and do your stochastic gradient descent update. So this is um, very scalable and amenable to uh, uh, parallelization. Um, not going to be the case in the uh, future. So that was our neural n-gram models. Um, so we've kept the n-gram restriction. So all of the, the problems relating to the n-gram restriction for count-based n-gram models still, still <laughs> apply to the neural n-gram model. You can't capture long-range dependencies. Um, but you can capture them a little bit better because if you think about what's happening in our neural model, we're taking our inputs from our history. In my example there, it was just two for a trigram. And we're feeding them independently into our hidden layer. And we're leaving it up to the hidden layer, the nonlinearity in that hidden layer, to discover correlations. Uh, the sorts of things that we might uh, discover that we capture with n-grams are things like New York, two words that, that very strongly occur together. So that's a sort of nonlinear relationship. The, the distribution over new and the distribution over New York doesn't give you, sorry, distribution over new and the distribution over York does not give you the distribution over New York happening together. So in n-gram models, we just explicitly count those pair of words are going together. In the neural model, we rely on the nonlinearity in the hidden layer to capture those for us. But that means we're not restricted to, um, uh, for long histories, we don't have to have seen that whole history before. Imagine we see a long history and just one of the words in the middle is different to um, anything we've seen before. So we've seen that history a number of times, but we've not seen that word in the middle. Our neural network's still going to feed all those inputs in, and it's going to give something very similar to if that um, uh, word in the middle had have been the one we saw before. So we're going to get correlations between histories which share a high number of uh, words. They're going to give us uh, hopefully reasonably similar distributions. Um, so uh, an example in English might be something like if we've seen lots of uh, the blue cat, the red cat, the green cat, then we've never seen uh, the brown cat, but the fact that we've seen the something cat is still going to come out with high probability. It's also going to come out even better than that because the neural models do capture correlations between words. 
So the fact that we essentially have a word embedding layer in our neural network means that words like red and brown and green are going to end up with similar uh, representations because they occur in similar contexts. So now where our count-based model would not have captured that these things are colors and, and share distributions, our neural model will. <laughs> so in our example with the brown cat, if we've never seen a brown cat, uh, we're still going to get very high probability for that um, because we've seen lots of other different colored cats. Um, so the, the downsides um, are not that big really. So the number of parameters scale with the length of the history. For every extra word you want in your history, you need another transformation matrix. But that's, that's linear in the history length, that's okay. Think about our n-gram count models, they actually scale almost exponentially in the, the history lengths because every time you add a new um, extra word to the history, there's almost an exponential number of combinations uh, to go with the previous words. So um, uh, the scaling in terms of parameters is actually pretty good. So a neural n-gram language model comes out in memory much smaller than the count-based models. Um, but as I said, all of the problems that uh, occur with the count-based models of finite n-gram history still, uh, still apply here. That if the dependence you want is five words ago and your history is four words, you won't capture it. Um, the final little point there is I said that in the n-gram count models, people have spent a lot of time worrying about um, lovely distributions that match the true distribution of language. Um, no one has really spent much time worrying about that for neural networks, so mostly we still train them with maximum likelihood, and we know that maximum likelihood is a bad objective for language. So there's still, it would still seem that there's, there's plenty of room for improvement if we think about objective functions a bit more, if we're a bit Bayesian and think about what the right prior distribution is uh, for language. Okay, so the final section that I have is um, going to be recurrent neural network language models. So, uh, and recurrent neural networks are essentially the sort of meat of this deep NLP course. So this is going to be a introduction to recurrent neural networks and just the basics. And then in the lecture on Thursday, I'll go into a bit more detail about the specifics and uh, issues and implementation problems you'll face with these models. But in this case, let's just uh, gently move from feed-forward networks into recurrent networks. So the idea here is quite simple, um, but the aim is, is um, ambitious. We want to go from a finite history to an infinite history. Uh, we don't want to forget anything. We want to capture everything we've ever seen in the past in our, in our model, and we want that to be summarized in our hidden layer H. So on the left, we have um, our old friend, the feed-forward neural network. The recurrent network looks the same. We just have this extra loop. And what that loop is saying is what's in the equation above, that the hidden layer is now a function of the previous hidden layer. So we're going to tie together all of our hidden layers over time. So that's just in the top there. So now where we had uh, essentially Vx plus C, we now have Vx concatenated with the previous hidden layer plus C. So um, this no longer is quite as nice a computation graph because we have this loop. And we have to worry about what do we do with this loop when we're doing inference. So firstly, let's just, um, in an analogy to the n-gram neural model, let's just think about how we sample from this model. It's essentially the same, just with a, a slight difference. So here we have our first symbol. Now, we don't have n-gram, so we're not feeding in multiple symbols. We only ever feed in one. Um, you can feed in multiple ones, but it doesn't really seem to help. So we'll feed in the start symbol. We'll get our softmax distribution P1, and hopefully it will be a good distribution over things that start the sentence. So given that we've sampled our first word, we can feed that into the next time step, just like we did for the n-gram model. But here the key difference is to see that we have this link here. Do you see that there? Yep, yeah, that link here, which links our hidden layer. In the n-gram model, there was no link there. So if we think about gradient, so gradient doesn't uh, propagate through my yellow boxes there because those are um, a discrete sampled uh, random variables and gradient doesn't go through those. So in the n-gram language model, there was no gradient flow from that second time step to the first one. Now we have that link across from H1 to H2, there is going to be a gradient flow and that's going to uh, uh, be something we need to worry about. So just like the n-gram model, we can sample one at a time from this recurrent model. 
um, each time feeding in one input from the previous time step and the previous h. So this looks very similar, but think about a key difference here. Previously, we summarized our history with wn minus 1 and wn minus 2. That was our summary of the history, those two words. Now our summary of the history is wn minus 1 and hn minus 1, the previous hidden layer. And so hidden in that hidden layer is going to be all of the things we've ever seen before, hopefully. So to come back to that question of gradient, so here's our feed forward network. The gradient flows nicely straight down. Um, but our recurrent network, if we look at it in this way, again, it flows straight down except for this extra loop. And we don't really need to know what to do with this loop if we're doing our, our if all we've ever learned is our standard backpropagation algorithm. So that's, that's a slightly difficult way to look at the model. But if we come back to what I showed you earlier, the unrolled version of the model, it becomes a bit clearer what we need to do. So now I've unrolled on our four time steps of our, our single utterance. Um, first little detail to note is we need a, we need a first uh, hidden layer to start with. Previously we needed um, our uh, start, two start symbols for our engram. Now we're going to need a start symbol and a, a start hidden, hidden uh, layer. Um, some people will just make that all zero. Um, other people will actually train it. And you can see that I have a little arrow there which shows gradient can go back into that H0. So we can learn a good initial state. Okay, so again we have our objective function. It's exactly the same objective function, cross entropy. Again, we have gradient coming back from F, but now we have this extra aspect where gradient is flowing between the columns, these little arrows here. So it's no longer the case that we can break up these columns, these um, networks, and give them to different uh, CPUs or calculate them independently. Now we have this problem that everything um, seems quite dependent on other things. So if we look at that more explicitly, so let's take one of the partial derivatives. Let's look at the, the way the uh, objective function f changes with the second hidden unit, so h2. If we think about what's going to influence h2 from those gradients, all of the time steps after h2 are going to flow gradient back into it. So previously, gradient would have just come down that column from, from cost 2. Now what's coming from cost 3 and cost 4 are all, all feeding back into h2. So this tells us that we can't independently calculate that gradient. So now we can't split these up. We have to treat these as a single unit. But that's, that's the only bad thing, really. If we step back, this is still a perfectly well-formed computation graph. We can still see this as maybe we saw our n-gram unrolled model as sort of four feed-forward neural networks. The way to see this is just one neural network. This is just one big neural network. You have a cost function at the top. And everything flows back and ends somewhere around H0 and the, the words at the bottom. So if you think of this as just one big neural network, then we just want to forward propagate and back propagate through the whole thing. And that's all you need to do. It's just the same old uh, um, back propagation algorithm. It's just now we're, we're viewing the unrolled model as the full single network. But it means we can't break these things up. So this is so you have to decide what your sequences are, your utterances. So you might want to run um, a neural network over an entire news story, say. Um, say you have a BBC news story. Um, later on in the course, we'll talk about answering questions from news stories. And so you might want to run your network over that whole news story and at the end uh, predict what the answer to a question will be. Now, if you think about that, you're going to get one big neural network for the entire news story. News stories. Um, average somewhere around a thousand words or two thousand words. That's a lot of time steps. Um, that's a lot of memory on your computer and it's going to be very hard to do. So then you're going to start thinking about how should I break this up? So you can break it up into sentences but then uh, where you break things there's not going to be any gradient flow across those breaks. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a key point and in the next slide I'll get to one solution to that. So this is backpropagation through time. It sounds like a, a new complicated algorithm, but the key way to approach this is just, it's just backpropagation. The key thing is we've just unrolled the graph on our full utterance. As, as we were just discussing there, we have this problem that this scales linearly with the lengths of our longest utterances. So if we have lots of short utterances, this is fine. If we have long, one long one like an article, or just if our sentences get quite long, this is going to be a problem. So 
A classic solution is something called truncated backpropagation through time. And you'll see this very commonly used in, in language modeling. And the idea is just roughly what we were discussing, except a bit more coarsely. So my little dotted line in the middle there is, what I'm going to say is I'm just going to say, I'm never going to, um, I'm only going to process two time steps at a time. So my truncation width is going to be two. And the little dotted line there says that no gradients backpropagate through this. So this is an approximation. I'm just going to break the gradients there. Um, if we do that, and now if we look at the, the gradient flow, we'll see that for H2, the only gradient comes through cos 2. Cos 3 and cos 4 now have no influence on H2. Um, if we look at H1, it will still be influenced by H2, but not H3 and H4. So truncated backpropagation through time, what we do is we just take our long sequence, and we just say it's some fixed interval. Um, normally it's something like every 10 steps, or 20 steps, or 50 steps. Uh, we'll just break the gradients. And so we'll just chunk up that long sequence into 20-word uh, segments. A key thing to realize about um, truncated backpropagation through time, and really the only uh, computation that you, the uh, complication that you have to worry about, is that we do forward propagate through the, the break, but we don't backpropagate. So what we do is we process those first two, we store what H2 was at the end, we do our forward propagation through H1 and H2, our back propagation through the cost functions, we do our, if it's a mini batch, we do our gradient update, but we've kept what H2 is, and then we feed H2 into H3 when we do our next um, uh, segment. So that means our forward propagation is still exact. It's still exactly what we would have got if we did the full um, back propagation algorithm. The only thing we've changed is the way gradients are back propagated. That means, it's, if you think about this for a while, you can sort of get your head around what this means. It means that in training, um, if you see certain dependencies within a, 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 a segment that's been truncated, you can learn them. If those dependencies are always across segments where you've broken them, you'll never learn them because a gradient will never flow back and tell you that something in the previous segment was useful in the next segment. Um, but if you see them within a segment, then you actually have a hope that at test time you'll be able to predict them across segments because we were always forward propagating across the segment. So if you think about that for a while, you can realize that if you th see things often enough within a segment, then you can learn to generalize them across segments. But you have approximated. So this is an approximation that does heavily um, hurt the model's ability to get longer range dependencies. Okay, so they're really the key, um, two key algorithms. Oh, there I'm just showing that... Um, Yes, for H2, the, the gradient no longer flows through H3 and H4. So that <clears throat> these are the two key algorithms you need for, for um, RNNs in general and RNN language models. Now, the classic choice that you'll make um, along the lines of what we discussed earlier is how to break up your, your long corpus, because I said you, maybe you've collected a billion words of English, you don't want one billion word sequence, so you're going to have to break it up. You can use truncated back propagation through time and just say, I'm going to break it up every um, 20 words or 50 words. Now, um, that parallelizes nicely because what you do is you say, well, I just take my whole corpus of billion words, I find a, a starting point every, say I've got um, uh, 10 CPUs, I break that into 10 equal segments and I start a, a truncated backpropagation through time sequence from each one of those 10 starting points, and we just, take, and we just bring those together into one uh, mini batch, do the forward pass, the backward pass, and then move all of those 10 um, sequences on one truncated step, and do that in lockstep through our big corpus. So um, at the bottom there, what I'm saying in this, um, these little diagrams uh, is that the nice thing about truncated backpropagation through time is that all of your sequences have exactly the same length. If your truncation limit is 50, all of them are length 50, except maybe for the last one, if it didn't quite fit. Um, so in uh, deep learning, we're always trying to, to mini-batch things. And hopefully you've come across this concept, but if not, the idea is that modern hardware can do matrix-matrix um, uh, products very fast. In particular, GPUs can do them very fast much faster than doing a matrix matrix product as individual rows. So you get a nonlinear speed up by forming lots of vector matrix products into one big matrix matrix product. So we're always looking for ways to do what we call mini batch, put together 
vector matrix products into a big matrix matrix product. And what I'm saying at the top here is that in RNNs, we have two big products we have to worry about. We have the recurrent one, so we have some hidden layer. If we're building a big um, recurrent language model, the, the biggest ones are up to about 10,000 units in, the, in a single hidden layer. So the transformation matrix we have there, um, V on that recurrent layer is going to be 10,000 by 10,000. So 100 million um, uh, floating point numbers. And that's a big vector matrix product. And that's going to take a little bit of time. So we want to do that really fast. Now, if we look at all our time steps in our um, recurrent network, if we can, rather than just doing uh, one time step in one sequence at a time, if we can take, say, as I said earlier, 10 sequences and do the first time step of all of them together, then we can form that first time step, in the um, hidden layers for that, into a matrix, just stick all the hidden layers together, all the vectors together, and they're all getting multiplied by the exact same V transformation. So we can just feed them in as one big matrix matrix product to our GPU and it will do them quite fast. And GPUs, modern GPUs are amazing in, in how much computation they can do if you give them big matrix matrix product like that. The, the first little diagram there is if we're doing back propagation through time and we have lots of sequences like sentences, they're probably going to be different lengths. So if we just break our corpus up into to sentences rather than fixed intervals, uh, when we look at our mini-batch, we end up with something like that. We end up with a sort of raggedy right edge. So, um, and when we... Um, GPUs do some things really fast and they do everything else really slowly. So they don't like exceptions. So when you feed something like that to a GPU, it just treats it like a big um, uh, fixed-sized um, uh, problem to deal with. So basically, the amount of computation is going to just be proportional to the longest sentence you have which is bad if you have one 200-word sentence and lots of 10-word sentences, because all those 10-word sentences are going to get bat might get batched up with that 200-word sentence and you waste a lot of time. So that's just something to think about when um, choosing your different algorithms. The, the, the flip side is you can be a lot smarter about that first case. Um, and uh, next week, hopefully, Jeremy from NVIDIA will come and talk to you about GPUs. And um, NVIDIA's... Uh, um, Deep Learning Library has some nice sort of under the hood optimizations for all of these cases. So you don't, if you're using that, you don't really need to worry about it, but you can, um, or it, it's useful to understand that there's these different trade-offs. Okay, so that was the, the um, our first introduction to recurrent networks. Um, the key thing we've done here is we've really dropped this n-gram limit. So now we're modeling much longer histories. And this seems like a small thing, but this is really what enables many of those examples I gave right at the start, like machine translation. We can't do that with n-grams. The only way we can do a machine translation is with something like this with a recurrent layer. Because when we feed in our French and we read off our English, the, chorus, the dependencies between the English are all going to be a long-range dependencies to the French word that they translate. So you need models like this that can capture those long-range dependencies. So if you can train models like this well, then it opens up a whole space of new um, applications you can do. Um, also, what we're doing with these models is not just language modeling, they're learning to compress history. So they're learning to compress strings into our hidden layer. So we can use this for lots of other things. So uh, next week uh, in the lecture about classification, we'll talk a bit about how rather than using a recurrent network to read in words and output words at every time step, we can use them just to read in the words, compress all of those words into a representation, and then use that representation as the sort of semantic content of that utterance. And we can use that to classify. So if we want to classify a, a document, um, we're not doing language modeling, but we can still run a recurrent network over the document, produce the hidden layer at the end, and then use that hidden layer as a summary of everything in that document to, to come up with a new class. So um, other properties of these models is now we just, our parameters are just a single time step. So we have one big um, recurrent transformation um, and our uh, softmax matrices. The downside is that those recurrent transformations can get quite big if we want to remember a lot of things from the history. Um, the big caveat with recurrent networks is that they're really hard to learn. So um, recurrent networks have been around for a long time uh, since the um, 90s or earlier uh, in their current form, as have stochastic gradient descent and other algorithms for training them, but they haven't really caught on until quite recently. And there's a number of reasons for that. 
And I'll go into those in the next lecture. But the key thing to know is if you take the sort of recurrent network I described here, train it with stochastic gradient descent, it probably won't work. It probably won't give you a worse result than the, the um, neural models and the count-based model. Um, but you have to think a bit more about uh, what's going on with these models. It's just not that easy to remember everything in a vector. Um, and also the caveats with the neural engram models still apply. Like, we're still mostly using maximum likelihood for some reason. Okay, going on to a bit of more of a esoterical theoretical comparison. Um, we have this space of models that we've been talking about, and we can think about this in the classic machine learning sense of a bias variance trade-off, which hopefully you learnt in your introduction to machine learning course. So, as a, a sort of straw man or, or uh, com comparison, consider a language model where instead of breaking things down into conditional distributions, we simply memorise each sentence we see, and we say the probability of a new sentence is just the, the frequency that we've seen it in the past. So um, the, we see a new utterance, we say how many times have we seen this exact same utterance before divided by the total number of utterances, and that's the probability of that sequence. Now obviously that's a terrible model of language because you hardly ever see the same sentence twice. So almost every sentence you see will have zero probability. So that's a bad, uh, bad language model from a generalization point of view. But the key thing to understand is it's an unbiased estimator of the max of maximum likelihood estimator. So in the limit of infinite data, that will give you the true distribution, which is a nice property. The problem is um, it requires infinite data. So it's a very high variance estimator. That is, if I give you any sample, um, you're probably going to get a, a distribution that varies um, uh, wildly from the true maximum likelihood distribution. So that extreme is high variance, but unbiased. If we look at our n-gram models, they're biased. So if our distribution, if our true distribution contains long range dependencies beyond the n-gram order, then uh, we'll never be able to match it. So no matter how much data we have, our n-gram model will never give us the true distribution. It'll always be biased, it'll always be off. But the upside is it has much lower variance because we're not trying to count these big long sentences, we're just counting these small um, n-grams. So we see them much more frequently and so after a few million words, we've probably got quite good estimates and our estimates won't change that much. So with our n-gram models, we've accepted a bit of bias um, to trade uh, for less variance. Now with our recurrent models, we're trying to have the, the best of both worlds. We're trying to get rid of the bias, so we're now trying to uh, uh, memorize entire histories. We've not restricted our dependencies. But we're also trying to get um, lower variance because given small amounts of data, smaller amounts of data, we should converge to something close to the distribution much more quickly. Um, the bias is going to depend on exactly how big our hidden layer is. Obviously, to memorize infinite data, we're probably going to need a infinite hidden layer or a very big one. But it's an interesting um, uh, opportunity to step back and think about these different range of models from that point of view of we're trading bias for variance. Um, not always in equal amounts. Okay, so we're coming to the end here. I've thrown in some references that you might like to read. There's a huge amount of information now in recurrent networks on the web and lots of really good blogs. Um, uh, lots of graduate students are writing really clear and well illustrated uh, blogs that um, lectures like me mine for lectures. Um, so look those up. Um, Andre Kapathy has a nice one about um, <coughs> modeling with recurrent neural networks. It will use some of the ideas that I'll talk about in the next lecture. Um, if you read that one, you should re really read Yoav's um, response to that blog, which says that actually count-based models um, also can behave in this way. But reading these blogs should um, teach you something about the difference between generalization and memorization. So it's a key question to ask yourself. Um, there's also lots of problems with initializing these models. And um, Stephen Merity talks a bit about those in his blog. And there's also a great chapter in the deep learning textbook, which is online and, and free, uh, that you can read and find out more details about these models. So that's it for today. As I said, that was my introduction to um, uh, basic language modeling and uh, basic recurrent neural networks. On Thursday, we'll dive a bit deeper. We'll look at the problems with training these models. We'll look at architectures which overcome these problems. Um, and what happens when we want to make these models deeper, wider, etc. Okay, thank you. Oh, feel free to ask questions, sorry. That's, that's a question. Uh, yeah. 
So, so we have a word at the beginning of the sentence that we have a recurrent network coming like 10 words, and I now want to do a point correlation between the first and the last word. Is that somehow, is there a restriction there? Yes, it gets harder and harder. These things have a sequential nature, and it gets harder and harder to, to, to discover dependencies the further you go back in time. And this is really uh, a learning problem. So these models can represent them, but the question is, can you learn them? And the, the further they are back in time, the, um, the weaker the signal is going to be. We're going we're to be a bit more exact about this on Thursday, but the weaker the signal will be, and so the harder for the model to discover them. But... Yeah, so, but one thing to realize is with, um, with the, the, the more modern architectures we have, we now can go quite a bit, uh, quite far back. And so uh, that's why we can do machine translation. We can go back 50, 60 words um, and get correlations. And we can also do, to a limited extent, simple question answering in this way, where we can read 2,000 words of an article, ask a question about, um, uh, that essentially asks the model to, to find a context that a word appeared in, and it will be able to find it. Um, the, a lot of whether the model can get these long-range dependencies depends on how much other noise is going on as well. So in language modeling, there's a huge signal from just the local uh, information. So in language modeling, the previous four words or so give you about 90% of the signal. So most of the time, that's all you need for the distribution. What were the last few words? And then a little bit of the distribution comes from what, what came on way back. So when you're trying to learn these, that you get this really strong signal from those recent words, and it tends to mask out what, what happened long ago. If you have a problem where th you don't have that, where the signals, you don't get sort of uh, a, a much stronger signal covering a, a longer one, then you can often learn longer dependencies. So it all depends a bit what the nature is, how much noise there are, there is, how clear these things are in the data. But the first thing is you should always start out skeptical. Don't just assume that these dependencies exist, therefore my model will find them. Any more questions? Okay, one up there. Uh, is modeling helped by uh, parts of speech, like tied to the words of speech? So, um, not really once you've got a certain amount of data, especially for English. So, um, these models, uh, so on the, in the previous lecture, we talked about word representations. These models are essentially, they are learning a word representation in their first layer. And that tends to capture part of speech information quite readily. So if you train these models on a lot of data, they've pretty much already discovered a lot of that information in the, the, the part of speech. Um, if you have a small amount of data, then that can help them with that information. Or if you have languages which are very um, uh, lexically productive, so morphologically rich. So for instance, Turkish, where you have a much bigger vocabulary than English because you keep sticking words together, having um, some sort of syntactic information that tells you that this huge word you've seen very infrequently has this particular function um, can be more handy. Were you going to...? Yeah. Um, do people ever just the weights in the current models with what they learned in a neural language model? Um, like the embeddings in the context? You mean like an, going from an engram model to a recurrent model? Sure. I've not seen anyone do that. Um, I mean, people try initializing them with um, word embeddings learnt with like word to vec or something like that. Um, again, if you have as any sort of significant amount of data, and in language modeling in that case, it's, we're talking a pretty small amount of data, it's not going to, to help. So even with small data sets like Pentree Bank and things like that, people aren't initializing with um, uh, word, word vectors. If you have a significant number of out of vocabulary words that you just don't see in your training data, but you do see in your sort of word to vec data, then, then you might get something out of that. But the, the things that the models are putting into those vectors are, a bit, are different enough that it's better to just learn them from the, the data you have. And the thing about language modeling is anytime we're doing language modeling on a small amount of data, it's probably reasonably artificial. So it's just not that hard to get vast amounts of data in most popular languages. Obviously, there's a few languages which are very rare and it's hard to get data for. But um, for any European language, uh, it's easy to go and find a, a, a billion words of that language online um, uh, very quickly. So, yeah. Uh, would you consider modifying the vector space in which the words live by making a note of whether it's an adjective or a noun or... Uh, you, you could. Um, and specifically for language modeling, I've never seen 
anyone um, get that to work, partly because these models seem pretty good at discovering it. Um, but if you take that idea further, um, there's a huge amount that we know about language structure um, from part of speech, but also to the sorts of things in, the, in my early examples, like uh, uh, language has hierarchical structure, it has um, uh, verbs have subjects and objects, and these sorts of things. Um, it would be nice if uh, we could put that in these models. So uh, I haven't seen much evidence that these models are discovering that sort of structure. So they're very good at um, uh, learning about linear, linear histories and helping uh, use those to predict the next word. But there's not much evidence, for example, my, my example about the sandcastle, um, I'd be very surprised if any recurrent network was able to, to do that well. So to pick out um, that what she was referring to and what there was, because that's quite a complex dependency. So part of the key questions for the future is how do we get that sort of uh, structure into these models. Um, later on in the course, Chris Dyer will talk about explicitly structuring the models hierarchically to capture this, um, uh, which is one course of action. Um, whether we want to use annotations from linguists to help the models, um, this never really seems to work. Uh, it seems to always work better to let the models discover themselves uh, what's there, but at the same time, um, we also want some bias to be in there. We haven't discovered what the right bias is yet or how to get the sort of those those hierarchical biases really nicely in.